always just licking its bum. <laughs> So James, tell me, br bring us through what happened. Yeah. So I had been working at Google for about four years, and I noticed that we had some inclusion problems on our team. Some people wouldn't go to our group lunches or speak up in our team meetings. So I went to a diversity and inclusion conference at Google. Unfortunately, rather than talk about how to you know, really include everyone on the team, it just talked about diversity and specifically racial and di uh, gender diversity at Google. And they said, you know, the population has 50% women, Google has 20% women, therefore sexism. And that was really how deep their argument went. And so they went through all these different things like microaggressions and unconscious bias, and they said that is why we only have 20% women. And after that, they asked for feedback and you know, I had actually been doing biology in grad school before going to uh, Google, and I knew a little bit about psychology and actually why uh, women might not be, or why there may be fewer women interested in tech. And so I wrote this, uh, the document, and I really explained, okay, these factors we have to take into account if we want to change Google to make it more appealing to more women and how we could actually uh, fix some of these workplace issues and remove gender from the discussion and just say, okay, some people have different personalities and that affects some of these dynamics. So I asked them, okay, what do you think about this document? Am I just in my own echo chamber or is there actually something here? And it just exploded. Well, so once it leaked out, all the top executives were sending out these disparaging emails about just how harmful it is, don't read it, this is not what we stand for. And uh, then uh, on Monday, they called me up and said, hey, James Moore, you know, you're fired for perpetuating gender stereotypes. Wow. wow, they called you at home on the phone. Yeah, I had been at home because I received some violent threats from coworkers. From your coworkers? Yeah. There's cross-cultural evidence of uh, women's interests being on average different from men's interests. There's no evidence that mean intelligence is different between men and women, although there is evidence that men have higher variability, which means we're gonna find more really smart men and more really stupid men than we are gonna find really smart women and really stupid women. Not to say that we haven't all met some really smart women and really stupid women, right? <laughs> but that there are gonna be higher numbers, higher variability, <clears throat> but the same mean with regard to intelligence, but with regard to interest, the means are different, right? And this, this is exactly what you write, right? The, the interests themselves are different. And you know, the scientist in me wants to say the truth will set you free. We cannot change what may be true at a societal level unless we understand why things are true. Why, why would we want to force someone to do something they don't want to do anyway? I mean, why, I mean that doesn't make any sense to me. It, it's, it maintains sexism, really, because if we are assuming that the choices that men make are the ultimate, absolute best choices, we are making men the default humans. The only reason women aren't doing exactly what men are doing in exactly the same way is because they're doing something wrong or they're being conditioned into not thinking the right way, because really they should be just like men. But in fact, the areas that women dominate, healthcare, education, psychology, publishing, these are all hugely influential areas on society. They are important. You are a gender scholar, although you study from the outside. Can you tell me a little bit about your background and how you know what you know? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm interested in it, but I'm not of it. And it is unusual to find people who will dedicate years of study to a subject that they don't think has worth, so yes. And so what, what, <laughs> what perspective are you looking at it from? I, I'm interested in the way people think. I find ideology really interesting, and, and there is a, a logic 
to this. It, it doesn't work, but there, there's an internal consistency that I do find both interesting and worrying. And so you're looking at the current postmodern literature within academia as, as the, the, you're reading the papers and looking at it as an artifact, like a cultural artifact to try and get to the bottom of how these people think? Yeah, I, I want to see how it works, just as I used to study um, religious ethics and, um, and truth claims and see how they sort of built on each other and, and how they sort of satisfied psychological needs, then I'm interested in looking at this sort of seemingly secular development, which also calls to a lot of the same, same sort of almost spiritual and um, ethical needs in people. Let's look at differences between men and women that are explicitly anatomical and physiological. Are men taller than women on average? Does anyone take offense at that fact? <laughs> Are you well, irritated? So, <laughs> so I would say you could be irritated by it. You could be irritated by the fact that women have to be the ones to gestate and lactate. You could be irritated by a lot of truths. But taking offense is a, is a response that is rejection of reality. So men and women are different on height. They're different on muscle mass. They're different on where fat is deposited on our bodies, right? Our brains are also different. So there are some binaries. Power, security. the volume can you hear can, can everybody hear all right well we're gonna raise our voices the conversation is gonna go on okay even the women in there have been brainwashed I have a really good patch on my jacket no you want to film my patches on my jacket <laughs> Oh no, I haven't touched anybody. Yeah, yeah we gotta yeah. give her space. This is not much I can do with her. Oh gosh, she touched me. The thing that strikes me about speaking to you is that there are rules to this game that we're finding ourselves in. Yeah, I mean, the, the term usually used to describe postmodernism is a cultural logic. It is a new cultural logic which goes against the modern ideas that we had before. It, um, it is unrepentantly irrational. It doesn't make a pretense to be reasoned and it doesn't make any pretense to be evidence-based. It can look like inconsistency, it can just look like hypocrisy, um, irrationalism, it can look hateful. And you really need to understand that this is the inevitable consequence of seeing society as constructed in language into hierarchical systems of power. Here, you can get your black diversity. What's that? So you can get your black diversity on camera now. We can get a real whole group. I even got Abe Lincoln for you. What's up? You're too close. I can't actually get you with this lens if you want to be in. Oh, that's really unfortunate. I'm sorry about that. They very uh, obviously so don't want to be in. So tell, tell, tell me about your thoughts. Whatever, tell me about fine. your thoughts. My thoughts? Yeah, on the event. Why did you do what you did? So if I were to tell you any thoughts about this event, it would be more than this event is worth, honestly. <laughs> like, you can't... But you've come here. You've come here. You can't argue against, like, what is a fact. Like, I didn't... I don't pay $2,000 of student fee funds to argue that a triangle is round. Yeah. And they're arguing... Not only are they arguing that the memo wasn't... Set, you know what? I'm not even going to engage in that shit. He didn't even mention the parts it. of the memo that were, in fact, accurate to what they are portraying him as, which is saying that there was biological But that determinism. actually doesn't matter. Yeah. That actually doesn't matter, because this has never been about James Damore. It's been about freedom of speech, and it's been about exercising power. I'm oppressed. He's oppressed. The interesting thing to me as I'm reading and looking more into this is that these concepts have paper, they have academic back. They began as academic papers. I mean, 
there's, there's a certain sort of um, feedback loop going on between activists and academics. But yes, um, I mean, white ignorance, I think that that was um, Mills, and uh, white fragility is Robin DiAngelo. Uh, white talk is McIntyre. So we're coming from the postmodern premise in the first place, and then we're building on that to develop concepts from that and then further concepts from that. And there isn't anything pushing back at it. There is nothing, um, there, there is no dialogue, a conversation going on about whether cultural constructivism actually is the right way to go. So there's, there's, no, criti there's no criticism of the cultural critics? Not within the field, no. There is a, a point of production and then there is a point of sort of dispersal of these ideas. You know, we have people, undergraduates going to university, that's, you know, somewhere between 20 and 50 percent of the population, depending on where you are. They are being taught these ideas, they're having to research them, they're writing them, they're going off then into industries all over the place, from business to media to healthcare to education. And they have been taught this conception of society as operating within constructed knowledge and systems of power. So what's, what's the enterprise here? What, what are they trying to achieve? From some of the reading and, and hanging out with you guys for a while, I'm starting to figure out it's, they, they feel as though the world is constructed by language and people are programmed by the language systems around them. So if we can reprogram the language, we can reprogram the world. Exactly, yeah. And um, people are not always aware on all levels of what they've been programmed with. And so this needs to be to be pointed out, to be to be called out, as is a very common um, term now. And people are expected then not to question it, but to accept it and address it. They kept a strict hold on everyone had to keep the same ideas, and anyone that uh, steers away is seen as sort of an apostate from this religion and you have to punish the apostate to keep everyone together. So underlying a lot of, of these battles that are taking place is two different conceptions of the world. You would say one is modern and the other is postmodern. Yes. And if you buy into one, one or other, the other of these conceptions of the world, you can't actually hear the other side because your fundamental principles are different yes. and so you're speaking from a different position in effect you're speaking a different language yeah and you you hear each other differently I, I have so many of these conversations now where people are just utterly bewildered by each other well why don't you listen you could listen and then why talk, would i talk listen to, to somebody telling me a triangle's round but they're, they're having a fascism they're having a q a at the end not free that makes no sense this is an interesting thing because I have smart friends within uh, Google and they, they were writing long rebuttals to DeMore's memo um, within my, my social media networks. Were they rebutting what he actually said or were they rebutting... No, they weren't. They were, they were, it, was, it was a rebuttal of... It, it, it almost seems as their interpretation of what, what he wrote, but um, when I read it, I couldn't, see, I couldn't see what they saw and I would... You know, there's, there's part of me that wants to you know, send them an inbox message and say, hey, did you actually read that? But I'm scared shitless. They would, <laughs> I would lose, I'd probably lose those friends. Yeah. And so how do we explain what's going on to that friend? You know, a lot of it was just trying to help our culture at Google. And, uh, but if you look at the surveys now, it seems like about 80% of conservatives uh, feel like they can't speak at all now which is really disappointing because, you know, the psychological safety, which is something that I cite in the document, is just being able to bring your whole self to work and feeling like you can speak up without being harshly judged. And that was, you know, one of the main measures that they saw actually improve team performance. But that's precisely what we don't have now, which is really unfortunate. I am reacting that way because I want to keep you safe. Well, you're 
Do you want to share your thoughts? No, I already did. Do you have any more thoughts? No. I'm interested in your thoughts. I have a thought. Yeah, you're why are you here? Exploding well, I'm, you? I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts. That's why. You're I'm interested are you being paid to be here? No. No? You so volunteer? I'm back. I've come all the way from Australia to see what's going on For in your universities. For what publication? No, it's just me. Uh-huh. I'm interested in what's going on here. I'm, in I'm actually interested in your thoughts. Kiwi Farm. All right, Fuck so the here's my thing. Cover the people! Thank you. Woo! People do not have the right to tell you what you can and cannot listen to. This is a university. If we cannot have this conversation here, we can't have it anywhere.